on this computer. Okay. okay, hey, we got this started anyways. Uh, everybody's in, two more people waiting. Let me see. Uh, oh, these two people, here we go. Lee Swanson, hang on, we're almost there. Uh, if you scroll, if you scroll up to the top, okay. that's where your screen, and, and bring your cursor along the top of the monitor. Does it light up the little green thing? View options. Okay. Uh, beekeeper screen. The beekeeper screen. Yep. Click on that. Okay. Just, does it open up another window or or no? Choose virtual background, remove pen, name. For some reason, it just doesn't want to open up. Okay, hang on. I got it. I'm opening it up. That's better. Okay, now if I hover over this, uh, we are recording and it looks like. Uh, we still got your monitor though, your, your screen on your, on your laptop. Right. So I don't know how to get it any bigger. Let me see. No. It opens it up this way. But for some reason, okay. All right, uh, Heartland Beekeepers, I'm gonna admit them. All right. Okay, so if I click over Kevin and I say, make host, we're gonna start this meeting here. Folks, I'd like to introduce you to Kevin if everybody's listening here, Kevin England. Uh, I think you're going to read your own uh, bio, Kevin, because uh, I have it here, but I'll let you introduce yourself, okay? Uh oh, I can't yep. hear you. Yep, that works for me. Let me just start my screen share here. Perfect. Can you all hear? Yep. All right. Great. And if I just click on him, I should be able to put him on the whole thing. No. Nope. Uh, if he's host, you he should be able to fix your. Th <laughs> okay. All we see is your screen there, Kevin. Okay, but I mean, I just gave him some privileges, I hope. You can see my uh, screen? No, I just see Kevin's. Yeah, we see your screen. I thought I clicked over your name and I said remove uh, or make you, you made the him host. I made him host, right. You're not seeing my screen? You should see the uh, slideshow. I see not a yet. slideshow. I see yeah. non blanks. Yeah. Yeah. Go okay. to the top. If you don't okay. see it, just go to the top. Under view options, you'll see one for Kevin England and then another for beekeeper. Switch to Kevin England and you'll see Kevin's presentation. Oh boy. Yes, that worked. I, I switched it. You are sharing screen. I don't know what that means. So I'm not going to. your screen. Just give a yell. Does anybody not see these? So what am I supposed to do? I, you Hang on. I got Kevin, go to the top of your monitor. I am. And then you got you got view options. You got two different things. You got the share screen thing in green, and then you got the view options. You are viewing Kevin English so screen. Three. All right. View options. I don't see view Stop options. Stop the share. Okay. There we go. Kevin, can you got it? I think. Yeah. Also, um, as the host, I'm going to see the people coming in the waiting room, so I will let them in. Okay. Yeah, usually we just share a screen that I, I keep track of the people coming in, so you don't have to worry about it if you do know. just regular share a screen. Yeah. I, did, I but, thought I did that. I uh, think he's got this. We ought to get out of his way. Yeah, and I like I said, I'm the Zoom host for Northwest, so I okay. know how that kind of works. Let me just move this out of the way so it's not. So... Last check with everybody from a hygiene standpoint. You can see my screen, everything's good? Yes. And yeah. you guys can hear me fine? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, first thing I do is just, I'm usually um, very diligent about being respectful for people's photos. So a couple housekeeping things. If you see the picture with me on the B, it's my photo. If you see the link, it's somebody else's. And at the end of the presentation, there'll be credit for it. I'm going to talk about bee vessels and the origin of what happened when people decided to keep bees in boxes. I'll talk about alternative hives, things that are out in the marketplace that you've never seen before. And then I'll talk about hives in practice. 
Um, before I get started, though, let me just take a minute and say hello. How you all doing? <laughs> I got a phone call and a text message asking if I would step in and do this uh, presentation. And when asked which presentation was viable, I know that uh, I have done this presentation for other clubs and it was very popular because it's not something you get to see very much. Um, a quick introduction of me. I'm in Central Jersey. I am on the west side of New Jersey, not the what exit are you from or Jersey Shore, as the joke goes about New Jersey. Um, it is farmland and rolling hills, and we are the garden part of the Garden State. I have about 20 hives. I'm an EAS master beekeeper. Been keeping bees since uh, 2008 with my wife and my children who are not in the home anymore, but they did help us keep bees when they were here. I belong to the Northwest New Jersey Beekeepers Association. I'm also part, obviously, of the New Jersey Beekeepers Association, and I do a podcast. I've been doing it since 2010. Just recorded my 200th episode, so I've been. I think I might be the longest-running podcast on the internet, and I love to talk about bees. I teach bees. I go all over the world, as you'll see in some of these shots, and. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat as we go along, or I'll collect them at the end. And you could just speak up. Uh, I think everybody's muted, but you could probably hover over your name and unmute yourself. Or if you hover over your screen, you'll see the controls for Zoom for chat. And with that, I'm going to dive right in. Unless anybody has any last minute comments, let's go ahead and get started. All right. So in the early days, of course, the bees were in the trees before the humans got to it, and people used to climb the trees or go to cliffs, cavities. If you follow the progression, not necessarily in this order, but earthenware, they made clay pots, mud, mud pots, and so on, vessels, so to speak. I think what happened is, as humans occupied space, they created different cavities that the bees found and moved into. And then eventually somebody had the bright idea, if I keep posting these things in this shape, I'll, I'll have bees move in. And they've kept them in barrels, they've kept them in gums, which are uh, hollowed out trees, tree limbs or physical trees. And then of course, someone invented the skep made of reeds. One of the interesting things about why they made a skep is there's certain places in the world where they used wood for fire and they cut all the trees down. They didn't have ready, ready availability to lumber, and it was expensive, and people didn't mill the way we do now, where you can go down to Home Depot. So they figured out how to make it out of reed or straw. And then, of course, again, another variation on the open container was the gourd. So in early days, they had all of these things. But at some point, someone decided maybe they could build a vessel. And the interesting thing was, if you look at this inside here is a jug. Back in the 1700s, 1800s, those glass jugs that you might find at a water cooler now were used for various purposes of transporting liquids. And they found that when they took the jug out, the hole created a space by which the bees would move in and occupy the box. And so it's believed that the modern hive invention AKA Langstroth, you could see the resemblance followed this dimension because these were super successful as people moved into them or bees moved into them. Now, as you know, Langstroth invented the hive and they come in all different forms and factors, all mediums, two deeps. Some people run eight frames. There are people who are just into nukes and so on. All of the stuff that Langstroth invented their hives, by the way, back then were different than what we use today, but our hives are certainly a descendant of that. They followed Huber and they followed Jerzen designs. These are the people who actually invented from the carboy the hive form factor. You got there by way of Huber. He's the one that invented the leaf hive. And this is really just frames that were coupled in the back with a hinge. 
every frame had a hinge that connected to the frame next to it, and you could pull the pin and separate them, and he would work his hive in a book. Of course, he wrote about this, and back in the days when printing presses allowed people to advertise what they were doing, they were able to see it. And there's a gentleman named Petro in 1814 who took that idea and put it inside of a box using something crude like frames. From there, Zierzin in 1835, he's the one that specifically came up with the box and the container and the hanging frames, but he didn't understand what B space was. It was Zierzin's design that moved us to hanging frames and not something that was fixed. And Zierzin published his information out to journals and it got into like American Bee Journal back in the day or whatever. And Langstraw took that and developed the 1851, 1852 patents for bee space and movable comb. And it was his design for the frames, the spacing and the box to right size everything that is credit to the modern hive that we have today. So I'm gonna take you on a journey of ideas because while people love the commercial-based Langstroth hive that we have today and all its attributes, there are still people from way back when and today making new hives that are not Langstroth. So we're gonna run through a bunch of them right now. And the first one I'll talk about is this one called the Bee Box Hive. It's meant to be an urban hive. You could put one of these on your balcony if you live in the city. And the cool thing about it is it has this feature that's a chimney. Sorry, the chimney is this tall piece where the bees go out and fly out of the chimney. And so you could stand next to the hive and you will not be in the path of the bees flying and leaving. Now they created a box on the top with a cover over it and they use these cartridges and the bees come up and build their honey and there's a slide kind of like a guillotine, but it's horizontal, that slides between the brood chamber and the honey box up on the top. You slide it closed and you open it and only a handful of bees up or up in the top and you can harvest the honey. So this is an urban beehive that is supposed to allow you to stand and look at the hive and operate the hive and no one gets stung. And it has a bee viewer. You can take the window off and see the bees and such. And you could buy this today. People are still using these. This is something called the tea slant hive. Bees start at the top and they work their way down to the bottom. My million dollar question when I saw this thing is how the heck would you work this thing? You'd have to stand on a ladder or something. I, I don't really understand the concept of this, but you would think, nah, I don't know if this would really work. Somebody built one. This you could buy today. This is a version of it called the Colony Beehive. You can go to their website, colonybeehive.com, and you can buy this. What's interesting about this is I've seen these in some training apiaries, and they're physically using them to good avail. I still don't know how you work it because of the, the design of it. It's not like it lays flat. I don't believe this one is on a hinge. So interesting design. And I'm not sure really what the advantage is other than maybe heat comes uphill. Uh, I want you to look at the way the frames are, because you're going to see that again in a, in a design I'm going to come up to. This is the Berkey Hybrid Top Bar. This one, you have to kind of look at it and say, these are built in a loop. It uses something called the golden ratio. The golden ratio is found in seashells and patterns all throughout nature. And if you took a piece of rope and held it in one hand and a piece of rope and held it in the other hand and held your arms out, the loop that the rope would make is the golden mean or golden ratio. And it's some perfect curve and the premise of this is if you build this hive with these hoops, the bees will build their comb to the perfect design as intended by nature. 
And this is really pretty common in a lot of hive designs that they use the golden mean. This is called the Berkey hybrid top bar. This is the sun hive. I'm not sure, can you see this or is the top blocking this? Uh, the statement on the top. We see the statement, free the bees from a principle that once okay, found in a cubic hole. I mind that the bar is across the top. Um, so the premise of this is it's kind of like a skep, but it's engineered structure so that it hangs. You can't, doesn't have movable comb. So in most of the United States, for example, it's illegal because you can't inspect it. But technically, you just pull those pins and the bottom part comes off. And like the hive we saw before, the golden mean should build down into the bottom of it. It's the biodynamic, biodynamic way of keeping bees. So it's not about making honey. It's about giving the bees a proper space to operate in in a natural manner. It uses all natural materials. The bees build their own comb and so on. This is called the sun hive and you can buy these they're for sale out on the web now this one i saw in 2013 or 14 at eas the middle picture on the bottom with the bees and the hive it was sitting in the lobby and i got to meet the guy on the top who's the inventor he has a back injury he had injured himself in the service and he can't lift anything so he created this cabinet that he can rotate and he has not no need to lift anything. I'm kind of at a loss and still don't understand that when you have a frame, and by the way, look at the custom frames he's built for this. The bees will build a natural slant somewhere between 12 and 18 degrees. So that obviously the liquid doesn't run out of the cell and the surface tension holds it in. If he lays the box flat and the bees build it out, fine. But when he rotates it up, I'm not sure what happens. Now, if you've ever taken a frame and turned it up, the stuff doesn't come pouring out of it. But it seems kind of odd to me that you would have the bees build something horizontal or vertical and rotate them. They must feel like they're on a tilt -a wheel but you can, again, buy these hives. And they do serve the purpose of no lifting. You just rotate it like a rotisserie and you can work the hive just by lifting the lid. It's called the Appalachian Rotatable Hive. I think he's only built a handful of prototypes for these. He'll custom build them for you. And you see he built different roofs and different designs. He had a bunch of different things on his website. This thing's called the Franken Hive. It looks like one big hive. It's actually multiple hives sitting next to each other. You can buy them in two and three configurations. If you look on the left, you'll see it's a two chamber and it has a divider through the middle, that bottom picture on the left. These are very popular. The nest is in the bottom box and the honey supers are the ones that have the handles on it. And you can put additional honey supers up underneath the roof and stack them until you're done. It's referred to as the Franken hive. I put a pin in this one. I'm going to show you something later that borrows from this design. This one's called the hex hive. Beekeepers love to build things in hexagons. It's a little strange because when you look at the frames, multiple frames are same size, and then you have the couple little runty ones on the side. The beekeeper did a lot of work craftsmanship on this hive, making the substrate very thick, making it out of cedar. And there's insulation in the corners and such. And his whole goal here was to give something that was a cavity akin to a tree. We all talk about the perfect hive for the bees is the bee tree. And this is the hive that gets, I guess, closest to it. I've never seen one of these in person. I'd like to see one. And the craftsmanship on these things from the website are pretty amazing. This is called the Dunford Urban Beehive. I don't know that this ever went into production as a mass-produced hive. They built a bunch of prototypes. They had like a 
you know, GoFundMe kind of thing. As much as it's supposed to emulate an urban hip hive, this was actually designed to be a low cost, shippable, packable hive. The whole point of it was you could break the whole thing down and put it into a carton. And they were looking to modernize places that didn't have access to modern hives. This was a design contest and a handful of these got produced, but I don't know what happened to Rowan Dunford, but I don't believe you can buy these anymore. They're kind of neat. Um, never seen one in, in use, but, um, you know, again, the whole point of this, that the concept was anybody could buy one that would ship in a flat package and arrive at your house and you could put it together and be a beekeeper and have a pseudo top bar in a modern package. This is called the bee house. This thing looks like a cooler. And in some respects, it's very similar in design and shape to a cooler, but it's an amazing hive. From an engineering standpoint, if you could sit down with a bunch of grad students and design the perfect hive, you would design this one. It's got a mesh floor and it's got insulated walls and engineered entrances and frame hangers and so on. And they followed what's called the Dartington hive. Dartington hive was a hive design in England that was traditionally made out of wood, but they made a plastic version. And what you can't see in this photo is there's actually a roof section to it. So like the one before, the bottom is the nest and the top is the honey dome. In the design itself, you could see that the plastic walls have big open space and that allowed for the insulation and this hive was um, purported to have great insulation properties for the bees so that they could survive the winter. And they had varroa inspection trays and built in stands and all of this other stuff and pretty sure you can buy this hive still today if you're in Europe. I don't know what the shipping would be over to us, but it'd be pretty amazing. But it's kind of a neat idea. I don't know, a lot of people don't particularly like the plastic aspect of this thing, but um, from an engineering standpoint, it probably looked pretty out in your yard. This is a top bar. The version is a Tanzanian long hive. It's similar to a Kenyan top bar, but it has straight sides. And there's a tip for you that Tanzanian hives with straight sides, the side meets the bottom at a right angle. And you could think of it like a T shape where a Kenyan top bar has angled sides, slope sides, and they meet like a K. So T for Tanzanian K, and it should help you remember if you're looking at a top bar, what style it is. This is like a Langstroth horizontal version. Uh, different, you know, it's a top bar, it doesn't have frames, although you can buy these with frames in them, depending on where you get them from. Traditional ones don't. These are quote unquote new to the marketplace, especially here for the United States. But quite frankly, polystyrene hives have been in use for decades. They were invented specifically in the Nordic region, Poland, cold winter climates in Europe. The one on the right is made in Finland. The one on the left is made in Poland. And there's other versions out on the marketplace. I'm going to talk more about the one on the right because I have several of them. If you think about this, it's not styrofoam cooler foam. It's far denser than that. If you went out and looked at, uh, you know, uh, ice chest or, or something like that, and you pushed and squeezed the sides and you feel how firm it is, you know, where you put your drinks in your cooler, that's how stiff the, the material is for this. And it's very dense, so it creates incredible ice insulation. Um, I'm going to talk more about the bee box on the right. Now, the one on the left is Lysen. They tend to be a little uh, 
more engineered squared off form molded and such but Lyson just came out with a new line that looks very similar to the Beebox brand and they're sold by Beebox is sold by Blue Sky I think they're out of Ohio and Lyson stuff is sold by uh, Better Be out of New York so you could buy these these are emerging is very popular in the United States now, especially in places where it's cold and or very, very hot because of their insulative properties. In the cold, the bees can maintain better temperature, more stable, and in the hot, the bees can get the air out and maintain a cooler temperature actually in hotter profile. So you see people in southern states like Texas where it gets 100 degrees using these. This is a Lions hive. This particular version was made by a Pennsylvania Dutch vendor. I saw it at a show. The cool thing about a Lions hive, and you can look at Leo Shereshkin. He's the big proponent in the United States for these. They came out of Spain. The frame design is supposed to be more natural to the bees. The top bar is shorter than a typical Langstroth design. But the frame, as you can see in the picture, is deeper. So there's one big contiguous face and it's uh, taller than it is wider, which is similar to the sheet of wax that they would build in a tree. According to Leo, one of the premise of this design and the reason the frame is shorter is that if bees have to build comb longer in duration than 12 inches, they would tend to put a curve in it because they want the engineering to hold the weight. It's only because we have such a solid bar across the top of our Langstroth hives that we can hold 19 inches of comb underneath it. But this one is set to the right length so that if the bees were gonna build it in nature, it's the natural width. These have inch, inch and a half, two inch, depending on who makes them insulated and they work just like a top bar the the frames all seal in tight together and a lot of people put insulation in the roofs for them more on this one in a minute too this is called a dreviville hive it's a slovenian hive slovenian hives you see these sometimes in pictures coming out of switzerland eastern france it's a box a lot of times either mounted in a garage or on a cart and they might have multiple of them right next to each other they're permanent hives they're not like a hive that you put on a hive stand the bees exit the front and you open the door and work them from the back and the way the frames work as you can see in the center is they have that ridge where they just rest on a bar and they slide in and out like a cartridge. They cover them with the door and you could see what's going on. And when you want to work the hive, you just open one of the doors of the three and you can go in and out of that chamber. And obviously they can pass down between them. If you've ever seen how people work these sometimes, in the movie more than honey there's a woman who has this big fat cigar and she's smoking the cigar and that's her smoker she's blowing the smoke into the hive it's really a cool scene in that movie incredible movie more than honey so this one is the u.s version sold of the sylvanian hive it's called the Dreviville hive I think this is the uh, last one, or maybe one or two more. This is called the Rose Hive. I'm going to talk about European hives in a minute. But the British National Hive has this penchant for a bunch of different sizes. And like we have standardized on a medium frame box so that the top box and the box on the bottom board are all the same size, that is the premise of the Rose Hive. British hives have different size boxes like us, deeps, mediums, but they don't call them that. And in this case, he 
he's just got bait and said, I'm going to make one standard size and every box is going to be the same dimension. And you can interchange all the equipment, trying to simplify it. This hive is becoming very popular in the UK in one particular uh, market. And I wouldn't be surprised if it takes off across all of Europe. This is called the honeycomb hive. You can look at just the shape of this thing and realize that the guy who manufactures these has a CNC machine. He's using a machine to cut all the wood. When I first met him and looked at the hive, it was made out of engineered wood, meaning plywood. And as nice as it looked, it was positive that in the wet environment of a hive, it was going to delaminate. This one is the most recent version that he's made, and he went to solid stock, and it's thick stock. This is so much nicer than some of the prototypes that he built originally. It's machined, it's engineered, you have to buy everything from him. But when you see the hive as a package, it is an engineering marvel. It's really a pretty nice hive. And he'll make different hives where it's so hard to describe, but he stacks them side by side. And because the shape is universal, one will sit on top of the other. He had one that he had hinges on where two parts came on top of the base one and you fold them out and you could work the left one, the right one, or the middle one independently. And then when you're done, you just fold them back in. I don't know how I didn't crush bees with it, but that was his one of his designs. So he's engineered the perfect hive in his eyes. Um, and these frames are really, really cool to hold. Now, if you look in the small picture in the subset, he designed one with cartridges so that you could pop the cartridges out and just like a Ross round or a hog half comb, it had the cartridges built right in. So you could buy different kits and interchange the frames. That was the point of this. Neat hive, especially the latest versions of them. This is a cork hive. There's two takes on this. I want you to look at the picture all the way to the left. The inside chamber is wood and it's cork on the outside. And then they put another coating on the outside and the cork acts as the insulative layer. On the one on the right, the cork is actually the interior of the hive. It's lined with the material called thermocork, which is a really dense cork. And it's manufactured. They say that it's equivalent to a tree. And you can go to corkhives.com and order one of these. So again, you don't have to buy a Langstroth hive if you really wanted to experiment. There's all these different types of hives that are out there. Last one I'll leave with is the Gariga hive. I just study the design, specifically figure two, which is the second one on the bottom. And you'll see that knob number 13 you turn, turns the crank, and it pushes the center down. What would the purpose of that be? To break the honey. December 1940, and this is almost the exact same mechanism of action as the flow hive. I thought that was kind of cool when we looked through it. I, I love to go into the patent archives and look at all the different hive designs, and this is one that I found that they're really, really cool. Real world hives. So now I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to talk about hives that are in use around the world. Some that I've seen and some that I actually own. I didn't mention it on the get go, but if you can't tell, one of my passions is I love alternative hives. I love to try them out and learn how they work and see them in action. I went to London in 2019 and met with a bunch of different beekeepers to talk about their hives and how they work. The interesting thing about a London hive, which they call a national hive, is they're square. Our boxes are rectangular, they're square. When they're square, that means the frame will fit front to back or left to right. And when they use them, they use them in a manner that they can run them the warm way or the cold way. That's their terminology for this. 
if you have all the end bars facing the front of the hive, if I'm not mistaken, that's the cold way. The reason being is the air can come in the entrance and pass in between all of the frames because the gaps are to the front of the hive. If you want to run it the warm way, you turn them 90 degrees, it hits that first frame, but it doesn't go through it, so the air can't penetrate and go into the hive. So they're square, at least the conventional national hives. Now, when you talk about a national hive, they have different kinds. I'm going to go through that because if you've ever talked to a British person, they come up and the first thing they ask each other is, what do you run? And it's not like us where, you know, are you running A-frames? Are you running all mediums? Whatever, they run a deep national and a national. And you could see by the dimensions that they're different. A national is the quote unquote standard, 18 and an eighth, 18 and an eighth. And it has frames that are 14 inch by eight and a half deep. It's the most commonly used one specifically because it's a little smaller. But some people who wanted more bees, more honey, bigger is better, went to the deep national. The difference is it's a little bit deeper and you can see the frames are 10 inch deep and 16 inch wide. The commercial people over in that region, Europe, UK, and so on, they run an even bigger box. It's a smaller dimension frame, but deeper, 12 inches. More honey, you would think. There's also a Dadant Jumbo. And Dadant is a different hive from a national, but it's a variation of a national hive that's even bigger. And this one's rectangular, not square. So it's a fascinating conversation to talk to the Brits because the first thing they all greet each other was, what are you running? Oh, I'm running nationals. Oh, I'm running deeps, you know. I went to Italy in 2016, and the gentleman in the upper left in the orange shirt is Giancarlo. Fun story for Giancarlo. I stayed in a hotel, and I kept saying to the people at the front of the hotel who didn't speak very good English, I'd love to meet a beekeeper while I'm here. Can you help me out with that? So one day coming in from work, the lady was waving a piece of paper to me, and it had Giancarlo and an address and a date. So I went to the address and there's no Giancarlo. I'm up on a mountain <laughs> and I'm looking at this guy who's washing his car in his driveway. And I'm asking him, do you know Giancarlo, beekeeper? Apicature, that's how you say uh, beekeeper in Italian. <laughs> and he gesticulates to me to get in the car. He hops in his car, he drives down the mountain about a hundred miles an hour, zooms down the road back towards the hotel, makes a right, drives through a field, comes up and there's Giancarlo's place with all these beehives next to it. He knew who Giancarlo was and took me to Giancarlo. It was really a great story. So Giancarlo never knew I was coming. <laughs> when I showed up, he was in his honey house and he had no idea who this American was. And he called the other guy who's a uh, mentee of his. He spoke English and he was in Rome. And I told him what I was doing and he came over and we sat and drank mead and talked all day long and worked bees. He was doing grafting and everything. So it was a lot of fun. So now to the point, Dadant <laughs> Blot. This is what they run. It's a variation of a Dadant hive. Dadant is the Charles Dadant that we know who has Dadant beekeeping here in the United States. This is Dadant Blot, which is the Blot variation of the Dadant plant from the 1800s. It's very typical that they run these in Italy and the, the surrounding countries. It's deeper than a Langstroth, shorter top bar. They have wider and smaller ones, 10 to 12 frames. Most of them that I saw in operation were 11 frames. And they have, like us, deeps, mediums, nukes, and so on. Usually they run this as a single brood chamber and then they put honey boxes on the top, like the one you see that's got a white roof over the porch and it's got a light blue and a yellow box. You could see here in the stack that it's it's uh, loaded with honey supers. 
I told the story of Giancarlo in my episode number 98, if you were ever interested in that. The cool thing about the data on plant one is luggage handles. <laughs> These are so cool. These are heavy duty industrial hives. So while I was in Italy, I rented a smart car and I drove four hours out to this place that was the biggest beekeeping operation and they took me on a tour. Again, they had no idea I was coming, but I got all these really cool pictures and demos of the stuff. Their hives feature a front porch, which I never knew why we didn't do this. I think that's kind of ingenious. They're an inch and a half to two inches thick. And a lot of them, they have this attachment that blue box hanging underneath is a pollen trap. It's kind of really a cool hive to see, but they're so heavy that you can't move them. Now, this is a cathedral hive. It's a relatively new hive, backyardhive.com. Corbin Bell is the guy. He promotes these. It's, again, one of those biodynamic natural. It uses the golden mean. This is Rick from RB Club. He brought his, which he has in operation. One of the interesting things about the design of these frames is they have holes in the tops. It's the super highway for the bees. They can come up to any frame because the frames have an angle to them, go up to the hole and follow the hole across and go to the other end of the hive, across the top of the hive. And you could see what they look like. The frames just rest down on the box and the bees naturally build, again, following golden mean the, the comb to fit the box and that dictates also the angle of the sides to perpetuate the golden mean for it he's had hit miss um experience with this thing very finicky hard to work the bees attach the comb all the time to the bottom um it's been complicated for him one of the things i taught him which he said helped immensely if you've ever worked a top bar hive where they build the comb down and sometimes attach it to the side, what you do is go in with your hive tool and you cut the side part and you take your hive tool and you push it up and you crush the comb cells closed along that edge. And if you keep doing that in time, it forms kind of like a club edge and they will not reattach that. And he said, after he was able to push these edges back, here, they stopped attaching the comb and the hive got a lot easier to work. So this is called a cathedral hive. Now this is a WBC hive. When I was a kid looking at the hives coming out of London, this is it. Those hives at the top were at Charles Darwin's house when we went there in London. It's a hive in a shell. The original hives had the shell built in to the outside area. And the telescopic design and the interior were all one piece as like a double wall and that extra space was meant to be insulation. And obviously the design of the angles allow it to shed off. They're considered boutique expensive. Only the gardens and the museums and other places in London use them nowadays. Everybody uses a national hive. If you want to be sentimental and get a copper roof and one of those things, you, you buy one of these. This is what the hive looked like at Thorns, which is the biggest beekeeping place in London where they sell goods. On the right, you see the shell. And that's pretty much what it is. It's empty, but it's just a bunch of boxes. On the left, you see what's inside the shell. So you set the bottom board and you set the box similar to our Langstroth box on the bottom board, and then you set the shell over top of it and you keep stacking them up. What I found interesting is these were pretty long. This box is huge. It may not show in the picture, but the, the length and width is square. It's very long and the frames are extremely narrow and they all had those spacers in them like that, which I don't the why they lock themselves in, similar to what you'll see sometimes in a Waray hive. It was a neat hive, but it looked like it would be a total mess to try and operate this thing because 
of being, you know, having to pull the outer cover off to even get to the interior. They're very fussy to work. And again, that's why I think people said they don't do it. Now, look at this beautiful hive. I went to Malawi on a trip to educate beekeepers. We were there for 11 days. We were working with this group that works deep within the villages. People in Malawi are subsistence farmers. They make pennies on the dollar and they're all poor. The other thing about Malawi is when you drive down the highway and you look to the left or right, there's no trees. We're, we're accustomed in the United States to being forests and trees everywhere we go. There is no trees, nothing taller than a bush, higher than your shoulder. Because all the people there, there's tons and tons of people. There's just people everywhere in Malawi have cut all the trees down. They don't let them grow. So anything they have that's made of wood is super shabby and they have to use it forever. They're very crude. They're very low quality. They have these fire ants that bite you. So they hang them from wires and grease the wires. This is the guy who owned this hive. This is somebody who was so proud. We had a bee meeting. He rode four hours in 98 degrees heat in that get up his best clothes and came to us on a bicycle. They have no idea how to work their hives there. The funny story is these bees are very aggressive. They're uh, scutellatic bees, which are African when you open it, they're all over you and you have to be fully suited from head to toe. The beekeeper operating the smoker kept coming in with the smoker and they smoked them so much that they drove the bees out of every little hole in the hive, and they were all over us. And every time he'd come in with the smoker, our apiarist who took us would push the guy's hand back and somebody lit a smoker and was on the other end. It was a lot of fun to work this hive, let me tell you. But these are neat hives. This is you know, Kenyan top bar, a uh, very crude style. And they make good honey with this though. And they get a lot of money for their honey and they can put their entire family through school, which is unheard of in that land. So we work the top bars with them and the bees move around so much that they just set them out and the bees move in. They don't buy packages. They don't do any of that stuff there. Now I went to South Africa in 2019, November, and I work bees with Kai Heshert. This is Kai. And you can see he's covered head to toe. They have a Langstroth variation. Very simple construction, no tongue and groove. Their hives are made of cheap, crappy wood. They run single brood chambers. They're down on the ground. Maybe they'll put them up on a log or something. Their hives are stuck out in the middle of nowhere. When you want to harvest it, you take the whole box. They smoke the hive. They knock the bees off. They put them in a separate box. They run to the truck. They close the truck. You do this at 530 in the morning. He picked me up at the hotel at five. I said, why are you here so early in the morning? He said, you can't work these bees during the day. If you do, you'll get lit up. They're calmer in the dark. So we worked this hive in the dark. This was at the end when we were wrapping everything up. They're all kept away from populated areas. This one was in a um, industrial park off in the bushes out and away. And we brought the honey supers to his car. We drove three quarters of a mile and stopped along the road, opened the doors, got out. We're still fully suited. All the bees left. We closed the doors, drove a little bit further, opened the doors, smoked the car, and then drove away. And when we got four or five miles we got out and took our bee suits off because the bees will follow you there but they run langstroth hives they run these migratory covers they don't have telescoping covers like we do they run no inner cover there they get in they get out they're done they're not docile with their bees or any of that because there's no need to be they're just crazy aggressive ah the flow hive I'm just curious if anybody has one of these. These things are beautiful. If you've ever seen one, the engineering on them, at least the first version, was, was amazing. Super tight fit to make the plastic. They got neat windows and so on. 
But my experience has been they've been hit and miss on building them out. You have to put the most amazing colony in here for them to want to build in that plastic. And you've got to do something to the best of your ability to prime the frames. I have one of these. A beekeeper gave me one because he tried it for three years and could never get any honey out of it. And he said, I'm done with this thing. You want it. You give it a try. I'm on year three of using it. First two years, I had no luck. I was eating breakfast one morning at EAS. And this guy sat down and I said to him, you know, you look really familiar to me. Do I know you? He said, yeah, my name is uh, Stuart Anderson. I said, the flow hive guy. <laughs> yeah. I said, Stuart, I have one of your hives and I can't get them to build. He said, you need to put the hive on the bottom, on the bottom board and let the bees walk through it. And you could spray it with sugar water. And he said, I don't know why it is. We'll set up 20 of these hives and every one of them, the bees will occupy just fine, except for number 18. Just something about that they absolutely positively will not do anything to touch it. We don't know why that is. But one, two, three out of 100, we get this complaint where the bees won't use them. So I don't know if that's what I got. But what I did this year was take my flow hive and I had a hive that was using their top entrance. And I put that box under the top entrance so the bees coming in the front would have to walk down through it. Ah, uh -huh. <laughs> that's my flow hive right now. I took that this week. They built out all, they built the first frame in the middle back in June and they didn't touch the thing and there were never any bees in there. And then all of a sudden, this like last three weeks, they filled these frames and there's tons of bees in it. I know that this hive wants to build honey and I forced them to build in this. That box looks a little ratty down below. That's a cedar hive. It's a custom box made with cedar wood. And then I've had it wax dipped. And what you see is the wax coating on it. You never have to paint this hive. It'll last forever. It's impregnated with wax. This colony is so strong. I'm, I'm positive it swarmed earlier, but it continued to go. And I forced them, massive colony. And I'm hoping by October that I can actually go in, turn the handle, and not go strike three. And like I said, this is one of the original versions of the flow hive. Really nice box. This is a garden hive. They look like the one in the middle. They're made by Albert Chuba. He has a machine that cuts and routers all these. And he also invented these metal pieces that you could build any size hive. Obviously, the boutique ones are made out of copper. I have one of these that's five hives with all the carved inlays. I put bees in it. They built all the way through three boxes. And then an ant colony moved in the bottom and chased the bees out. So I took it apart. It had drawn comb and I needed queen banks. And I used each one of these little boxes. You see the little tab here. They come apart. You just flip the tab and the boxes unlock. That's how they're held together. They each have a little thumb tab that comes in and, you know, you could tighten the screw or loosen the screw if you ever wanted to secure them permanently. And so I used them as queen castles. Now this year I don't have a colony in it, but next year I'm going to put one of these out in the garden. And I just have this temporary roof on top of it here, but they do have this nice roof. I think this hive shows potential. I would be very concerned about it swarming in the spring. I'm, I don't know how you could put a full size colony in this thing and not have it swarm. And I'm going to put it um, in the garden this year <laughs> coming up. So this is my bee box hive. I'm coming back to that hive from Finland. This is my personal box. It's a 10 frame one. I bought it in 2015. This is the most amazing box I own in my apiary. If you've ever listened to my show, you'll hear me say that I love this box. I'm not gaga crazy promoting it, but personally, this box has made the most honey for me every year since I put it in service and the bees survive in this thing. One year, I had a massive colony and the 
entrance reducer got clogged and all the bees suffocated. It's the only time I've ever had a loss because you see the roof come straight down on top of it. Now, the interesting thing about this is it has inch and a quarter, inch and an eighth. And when I shoot this with my FLIR camera, I can't see the colony. It's insulated that well. Only in the handles, if the heat is radiating through the thinner part, can I maybe get a glimpse of the heat, but otherwise the heat stays inside this thing. Now, what I do is I put an Emery shim underneath the roof now with an opening in the top. And I always run a small entrance on the bottom and small entrance in the top. So should the bottom one get clogged, they'll always have some way out. Now, in the beginning, I had some fussiness with trying this hive. I glued it with tight bond, which is a common glue that you'll find in a box store. It didn't hold up. The box came apart. I have since discovered a polystyrene glue called Uhu Pour. I don't know why I got that name, but that's what it's called. U-H-U-P-O-R. When you glue it, it's cemented solid. You'll never have a box come apart. And I've re glued all my boxes with it. Now, the one interesting thing about the roof on this hive is it has this dish in it so that you could flip it over if you wanted to in the summertime. And it creates an upper entrance across the whole width. And one of the things I see with the hive is the bees build comb up into the dish. I'll have a picture of that in a second. This is a six frame polystyrene version of that hive. 10 frame to 6 frame. I love these things. The utility of these boxes are amazing. Now I had 6 over 6 over 6 over 6. It was 4 high. I had a big colony in one of them this spring. Swarmed away. It didn't have enough space to maintain a full-size colony. So lo and behold, they make 8 frames of these. And I just bought them. So I used the 6 frames for my queen rearing and queen castles, because you could put a divider down in the middle. And what you don't know is this entrance that's on the six frame is also on the back. And if you put the divider through the middle, you can have three frame and three frame with the divider in the middle, and they have their separate entrances out the front and the back. And I do queen rearing and use these boxes. And then when I want, I put them in another box and make them a six frame nuke. And they, they're spectacular for nukes in the spring, especially in New Jersey. We tend to have cooler springs where it's cold one day and warm another day and so on. But I know people that I've talked to when they found out I run these that run these in warm climates. They say that the opposite of what I say, I'm great for keeping the warmth in the hive. They're great for keeping the heat out. On that super hot day and humid day where the heat's trying to radiate through your wooden box, doesn't happen with this. The bees can maintain a consistent temperature. And then I have one listener for my podcast who's in Alaska that runs these, and he had broodminders put through, look up Etienne Tardif. And he's convinced that the bees do especially well, no matter what the climate is. He has days where there's 20, 30 below, and they do perfectly fine in these boxes. So this is where I said before that sometimes in that gap under the roof, they build burr comb and I just scrape it off. And, you know, did I mention I love this hive? I love this hive. This hive makes the most honey of every box I have every year. I had two supers full by June put three more supers on and they filled it by the end of July inside this box. It was amazing this year. This is a Waré hive. This is uh, somewhat boutique nowadays, but this is what they run in London, certain parts. It was the every man's hive as invented by Emeril uh, Waré, Emil, his name is. This is my hive. I built this hive out. It, it's uh, sold by a company out of Pennsylvania, Sweet Valley Hives, and the hive did really, really well. I put a mine away quick strip in this thing and <laughs> gassed the whole thing out, and I killed it. 
I didn't know that the dimension of it is smaller. And even though I chilled that Mighty Way Quick Strip and I put it in at in the evening and I gave them extra boxes, it still killed the colony. So now I use Apivar and I use oxalic acid on it. I don't put Formic or Mighty Way in it. I just restarted this hive. It's got two boxes built. I don't know for the life of me why they won't build the third box, but I've been feeding it like crazy, hoping that I can get it to three or four boxes for overwinter. But it's it's doing okay in my yard right now. I probably have a picture of it later on. Now, the interesting thing is this is a small box. Um, compared to a Langstroth, that probably only has a third to half of the size and you don't extract this hive you do crush and strain you have to cut the comb out and if you learn about how to work a wear a hive you nadir it when you want to add a box you don't put it on the top you lift the entire stack and they make machines with cranks like an elevator and you put the box underneath and the goal is is that they'll put the honey in the top and as the honey rises to the top, you pull the top box off and you harvest it. You have to cut all the comb out and then you put that box back underneath. The interesting thing, if you look at this box underneath the roof, there's a gap. The gap was meant there's a quilt box under the roof that holds the insulation for the hive. It's filled with sawdust, but then there's a gap over top that allows the air to flow through and you could see a wren built its nest in there used to scare me all the time as you could see this box was placed in the woods I, every time I come in a wren would fly out at me so this is a I love this hive it's finicky it's fussy but I really do like working this hive a um, lot, lot of fun in looking at how the bees built out the comb and how they organize their nest they've really built everything through the center and store everything to the outside and to me, if you think about a bee tree, this is very similar shape format wise as to how they would organize the nest. So I love to go in and see how they built it out. This is a Lance hive. Lance hives are used in Spain. I showed a picture of it earlier. They're like a top bar, but they're horizontal. And like I said, they got shorter top bar frames, but deep comb. I collected a swarm and put it in the nuke box, which you see in the upper right-hand corner. And I built the colony out to six frames, and then I moved it to my full size. These are promoted by Leo Shereshkin. You can find them on his website, the plans you can buy, or you can buy the hives. They're 20 to 22 frames, but you could build them bigger or smaller. And people custom build them however they want. They're usually made with heavy timber. I collected a swarm in 2020 and I put it in that box. And by the end of the year, the thing was from left to right stacked. I moved my apiary in the spring. And when I looked at the box, going into fall, it was bees from left end to right end, top to floor to ceiling. Whatever happened with this queen, it was really strange. They contracted back to two frames. And that's where they maintain the nest coming out of spring. I don't know. This is a swarm, so it behaves a lot like a carniolian swarm. They scaled way back in winter and they exploded in summer. This box is back to full song. If you followed my Instagram feed, you would see just four to five inches of bees bearding across the entire front of this box this summer. It never swarmed. And I harvested six frames of crush and strain honey capped from top to bottom and got 70 pounds out of this hive this summer. And I put the frames back in and they, they're building them out like crazy. Now, the interesting thing about this is that when you buy it from Leo, like the nuke that you saw before, let me go back to that. These frames can come with foundationless, 
this one's foundationless it's got no wires or you could put foundation in it they sometimes have a crossbar through the center of it and it helps to support the weight but you really don't need it the foundation that leo sells is pure foundation that he got from spain and it's all melted wax not from you know methyl ethyl death because they don't use pesticides there so my box is a mix of everywhere you see one of these staples you know that it's foundationless and where you see the wires you just kind of see hints of them in the presentation there's foundation in it this box did really really well and this box is a blast to open up and look at what's cool like a top bar is you pull the the follower board out of the back and frame by frame you pull them out you don't have a lot of bees in the air they're not angry easy hive to work the frames get a little heavy when they're full of honey but otherwise they're very manageable and it's just a pleasure to work spectacular summer just amazing hive this is my top bar a friend had a um, floor that they were doing oak flooring and they had all the scrap and I built the box out of scrap. It uses a Kelly F frame Langstroth bar on the top, and that's the secret to it. When I originally built a box in this inset, it was three deeps wide or three mediums wide. I thought bigger was better. Bigger is not better. <laughs> and I wanted to keep trying. So I worked three seasons and I could never get the bees to build this thing out. Now I have friends who have top bars that are size of a coffin i could not get them to build this for whatever reason so i went back to the drawing board and i cut the hive in half or in the thirds this is the 2016 version of it now it's too wide last year i put a colony in it and it's amazing it was built out two-thirds to three-quarter by winter and this year it was full from floor to ceiling and it was full left to right now the picture in the inset, those white boxes are feeders. But the cool thing about it is the inner covers that are sitting underneath the feeders can be swapped and put on top. And I put mediums on top of it. So when the colony filled out left to right, top to bottom, I put regular Langstroth mediums on top of my top bar and they filled it out and I harvested both boxes this year. But they also had honey down the long end and I was able to pull the boxes, harvest the honey, and put the roof back down on top of it, and there's still a full working colony. So it's a combination top bar Langstroth box. This again had that issue where the bees were attaching to the frames, especially since they weren't smooth, and I was able to push the comb back and they don't attach it anymore. And if you notice with the frames, the frames are like a Langstroth, they've got the gap. So when you take the roof off, the bees come up. They're not like a traditional top bar, but the whole point of the gap is so that they can come into the honey supers when they're above them. And there's a two inch insulation foam panel inside the roof. I insulate the hive for winter. The one thing about the wood that I used, the flooring is, it's half inch, but where it's carved out, it's really thin. So I think, uh, let me go back to the previous picture. Um, hmm. I'll show you a picture of it insulated. There you go. I just had to hit the button one more time. This is how I insulate the box. It's got an insulated roof. I insulated the sides with pink foam and put bigger insulation on the end. And it went through winter really well this way. So... <laughs> You look at all these things and you say, maybe I'd like to try one of these. This is where I say to you, do some research. But the problem is some of these hives, like Galean's hive, they're small little communities on Facebook. You get that 10 beekeepers, 10 question thing where everybody tells you different stuff and you almost have to experiment. How do you treat these hives, things like that, if that's what you're doing, and it becomes a challenge. So you have to think of all the angles and you really got to be resilient. I would suggest to you to run Langstroth in your production operation and use these as play hives. And I'm not saying don't take them seriously and be stewards of the bees, but do expect that sometimes you're going to have surprise, right? And you should be willing to go it on your own. 
maybe there's a community you could work with. But, you know, I frequently in my training classes have people who come up and say, I have this lane hive and nobody's ever had one. Well, I have one. I can tell you how to use it, you know. So maybe you could find other people out there. In the end, follow the basics. Look at it, operate it like common sense. The biology of the bees and what you see, if the comb is dry, they need to be fed, stuff like that, right? And make sure in these hives especially that you understand bee space. Unlike Langstroth, it's not automagic. You have to make sure that you follow what's going on. If you leave frames out, they're going to build wonky comb and stuff like that. The last thing I'll say is there's a bunch of different hive designs out there. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. Don't go too exotic. Stay with the more mainstream stuff. Now, that being said, what am I working on? <laughs> this thing on the right-hand side is a This End Up Furniture Company box. Anybody ever remember those? I saw advertisements for these back in the 70s and 80s. You know what they're made of? Really good, dense wood. I found a couple of these alongside the road one day, and they went into my truck, and now they're in the shape of a top bar hive. And I'm going to finish that and put that out next year. And the other thing that I'm building is a aquarium hive. What I'm going to do is cut holes, circles in it. And then I have um, these plastic plugs that go through and you screw on like, a, you know, similar to what you have in a capping tank. And that's going to be the entrance and exit for it. Um, I, I'm looking forward to playing with this hive. And what I'm going to do is build a shell around it where I can contain it with wood. And when I want, I'm just going to pick the wood up and take it off, and I'll be able to see the glass behind. I don't know if anybody's ever used those plexiglass inner covers that you can take the roof off and look down into the hive. Well, this is that on steroids. So I have a, a frame that I built for the top of my fish tank aquarium and i have the glass cutter and this winter i'm going to build one of these and i made a fitting that sits down over top of the glass that allows the frames to sit in and then i have a roof that is insulated that puts over top of it so i have no idea how a glass fish tank will work outside but i'm not the first if you look around you'll see people who have these this is my yard as of three days ago before the hurricane came through. Um, you can see that I have my polystyrene hives. This is the flow hive. This is my top bar. This is my lands. The ware is out front. These are the eight frame polystyrene hives. I bought three of them this year. I'm using it. This hive over here that has the cow pattern. Um, I should mention that so many people know me from that euthanizing the hive video from that box that has the cow pattern on it and i have hives out and out yards and whatever but like i said i love to play now this for those of you who've seen me on youtube or whatever this looks different from my normal yard i moved my apiary to a different location this year it used to look like this uh, they were all in a row different pads and um, the people who own the field next door to this uh, sold that field and I didn't want my bees on the perimeter so I moved it up to my my new yard and this is what it looked like over winter I will say that you can insulate your hives here in the north I don't have to I have insulated hives I'm guessing you guys don't have to worry about that too much where you're at but um, for us up here insulating hives has become a, a little more popular and I like my I designed these hive stands made of PVC and I use them for all of my things. Um, I'm going to pause here because that's that's where it ends and answer any questions. And then I just wanted to show you a little of the what's going on in our world over the last couple of days. So go ahead. Speak up, folks, if you got a question uh, for Kevin. No. You have to unmute. Uh, oh, I have to unmute somebody, or they can unmute. I'm just going to look at the. Yeah, I don't see anybody that's unmuting themselves. 
Yeah, Steve Brown said the warm way uh, when it's cold and the cold way when it's hot. <laughs> he's still a host, so he has to. Okay. I have to unmute you. Yeah, you're the host. Yeah, you you can unmute yourself. Anybody that wants That's to what ask I a question. Right. Yeah, you just hover over your thing and say over your speaker that says muted and unmute yourself. Yes. You got a chat from Amanda. Amanda just says, yeah, that's been a really fascinating presentation. I've enjoyed it. Um, Arca B Racing. What is that, Steve? Steve Brown. <laughs> Steve Brown. That, that had to do with the T-shirt you were wearing at that one oh. photo. Oh, yeah, that's what it was. The Arca race at Flemington. Okay. I live near Flemington, New Jersey. I guess you're a race fan, huh? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. We... Um, we I grew up at the time. racetrack, our family races. In fact, we're supposed to be racing Grandview Speedway tonight, but yeah. You're here with us instead. Uh, I caught that pollen trap on your blue hive there in that one picture before yeah. you pointed it out too, because I am a big proponent of uh, porches for the ladies, especially down here in the South, so they can sip their tea in the comfort of the rainstorms. Yeah. Yeah, I like the porch idea, and and we had uh, different people invent different roofs with little out outcroppings that protect the front entrance, and uh, especially when I went to you know my son lives in Seattle, and they have so much rain there that they were inventing things that protected rain onslaught from getting into the hives. Yeah, my my top bar that I put together, uh, the one that had three cameras inside it. The, one of the features was large overhangs because I was mimicking actually the Florida early architecture pre air conditioning. It was very successful. And you have some very nice presentations and uh, really loved all that information about the different hives. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. So, uh, Kevin, you think that the shorter bars across the top of the uh, frames, like I saw in a couple of years, are actually better than having the long 17-inch uh, regular lengths, Ross? It looks like uh, you have a feeling that 11 or 12-inch bar across the top works better for the bees. Is that a... Uh, yeah, in my time, I've cut up a bunch of different bee trees with people. I've also done cutouts. I find that... The design that I saw in my Langstroth, where they store the honey about the top third, they put the brood chamber down through the bottom third, they surround the right side of the brood nest rainbow with pollen, is what I've seen in the natural settings and also in the settings where they build in a cavity where they have the size. And the other thing that uh, people pay attention to nowadays is if you think about the way a sheet hangs in a hive, like this is an all medium in the front. You have a top bar, comb, bottom bar, top bar, comb, bottom bar. It's not contiguous. There's two breaks in that three everywhere there's a seam. Now you have a double deep. There's only one break. But when you're looking at those others, there's no breaks. And there is something people say about the biology of the bees that they like to have that contiguous ability and those breaks are not natural to them. And kind of use you... the shit out of that medium thing for Lee, doesn't it, Kevin? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking. <laughs> Michael, no, push a, me on this one, please. I run an all medium hive. I run eight frame hives just to try them. I run 10 frame hives with mediums on top. It's not I, you can see style. I have everything. I'm, I try everything. Because on the podcast, I have people who ask me and in my training sessions about all these different form factors, and I want to be able to explain to them what's what. That's awesome. Anybody else have questions? I would say real quick that the guy, I don't remember the name, but he, he uh, the Rose Hive, that's it, the Rose that did all the same boxes. Yeah. Okay. That's a guy who finally said, I'm done screwing around with this stuff. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, 
Amber, thanks for that. Well, we all thank you here uh, from the Science Museum here, Kevin. Uh, that was great, or the presentation. And uh, we wish we could have you down here, but this freaking COVID is driving everybody crazy. So yeah, uh, all we can say is stay safe, and uh, we hope for the best for everybody, for sure. Yeah, forgive the mess in the background. I don't know if you all can see that on the picture, yeah. but this is the shot from Wednesday of the rain that occurred. And where the white is right here in the center, is exactly where I live. And as you can see by the chart, we got 10.3 inches in two and a half hours. Wow. It just flooded everything here. We, you know, you see those pictures on the news with towns that are underwater. Everything here in our part of New Jersey is just incredible. We've lost people in our neighborhood. They floated away and didn't survive. And wow. there's houses off of foundations and basements Everywhere you drive down, there's roads washed out, bridges got wiped out. It's been a crazy week for us, and this happened on Wednesday. This is my yard. I went up in the middle of the storm and looked, and this big limb fell. It's like 12 inches in diameter between the up. hives, <laughs> but didn't hit them. And there's six inches of standing water there, but all the hives did okay. This is my neighbor's yard, physically at the end. This pond was eight eight feet high and these hives were underwater they said when they were standing on their deck all they could see was just the top of these two hives this one was completely under and the following day all the bees came back we have no idea what they look like inside but he had them strapped down and anchored so well that they didn't wash away and we'll know we'll find out this week how they fared but a lot of our beekeepers around here, uh, quite a few of them reported their hives just washed away from the storm. So pretty, pretty rough week for a lot of people here in our region. Yeah, we've been watching that down here too and really appreciate your effort here tonight in the midst of all that. With one more question of all the hives that you presented tonight, uh, the comfort hive. Are you the comfort hive, yeah, Where? I, know, I know Sam. Okay. He, Sam's um, a club member here. Yeah. He's a local. I know. So, I know Sam. In fact, he, uh, that all might is, be in your slideshow. You know, did, you know, that's interesting. That'd be a great addition to this. <laughs> I, I was just told, you know, one of our beekeepers did dozens of those hives, and they thought they were fun to work with, but they struggled so much with cross comb that they gave up on them. But. Uh, they did like tinkering with them quite a bit. They were going to run their whole full operation with them, and then they switched. So they just well, you know, Sam do uh, does he does it all, but he does that. Tucker's doing that. There's another operation. Yeah, that is yeah. using, a, you, uh, using it too, uh, and that's one thing I've always amazed with his that I've ever seen and worked with Sam was they didn't cross comb stuff. Yeah, and I'm like, you pull that little foil bubble lid off and I'm like they're just doing their thing it's a beautiful beautiful beat yeah I've been following Sam since he was keeping things in cardboard boxes and some of the other <laughs> stuff that he's done. I, I've known him for quite a not known him personally although I have talked to him I, I've known of him for since it, since he showed up on the scene he's he's interesting to follow for sure yeah uh Sam's science is more impressive than people know just because he'll dive into a dumpster, you know? Yeah, yeah. So let me stop sharing here and give you your control back. Uh, there you um, go. Should I make you the host, Kevin? Yeah, I guess, yes, that'll be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Right, thank you, Kevin. Alex, did you enjoy, want to say something? Enjoy the night. No, I just said uh, Kevin did a very well, a very good presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yes, he did. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for uh, your Hello. presentation. It was uh, very well done. You're a very good speaker. Uh, uh, I should say our... that I'll take a copy of that presentation and put it up on my website if you want to see it again. It's bkcorner.org. By this weekend, I'll put a copy up. If you search for presentations, 
it'll be in there for you. Okay. 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 Thanks, awesome. everybody. All righty. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Thank you. You Bye-bye. have a good night now. Be Thank safe. You. Thanks. I'll be well. Stay safe. Okay, kids. Two people entered the room. So how many people are in person there, Kevin? Yeah. Eight. Huh? Eight. Eight. Hey. Hey. Hey, everybody better get the raffle tickets. We got the good. tickets. Hey, you guys, before you start the raffle, can you guys hear me all right? It's Gabby. I, yes, I hear you, Gabby. Go ahead. Um, there was quite a few people contacting me. They were not able to join the meeting because no one let them in. So maybe for the future, we can pay more attention to that. Well, yeah, our host here was supposed to be able to let them in because I don't know where I can let them in now. I just let two people in, but now I have the power to do it. I could once I let him yeah, in. You got, when, you, when you share the screen, there's yeah. multiple, there's two ways of doing it. It's one is making him the host. And then there's another one where you're just sharing the screen, but you're the host. Gotcha. And well, then you have to watch the screen. So, so why don't you get better and get back here and do it? Yes. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> hey. I'm not complaining. I'm just making a suggestion so we can find a solution for next time. Well, we like that because we have Jennifer Berry, folks, next month. And somebody better be able to let everybody in here. We had 17 participants today. But I got a feeling we're going to have 40 next month at least. Don't say and we would have had more today if we would have had been able to let them all in. But the nice thing is we have it recorded and then Kevin will also um, share his PDF. So everybody will have access to his presentation. We are yeah. going, yes. Kevin said, he was, Kevin said he was going to let people in while he did the hosting. Maybe he got sidetracked. Yeah. No, no, I was looking for it, but he said he was going to do it. The other Kevin. Exactly. Yeah, the other Kevin. Yeah, the other Kevin. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Thank you guys for doing all the work. Appreciate it. I'm happy it worked out. All right. Yeah. You did good, Gabriella. Yep. Yep. I see. And, uh, we'll even get even better. He said he was going to record it. I've got this recorded. It says it's recorded on my computer. So I'm going to figure out how to link it to our webpage, maybe. Hey, when, yeah. when you do that, I, when you do that, I got a couple of them recorded on mine. Okay. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> All right, well, hey, uh, hey, well, we thank you all for joining us. Don't forget us next month, uh, Jennifer Berry, and uh, hopefully Eric will be bit, back in the saddle. Bit business, business meeting, business meeting, second business Wednesday meeting of the this month. This Wednesday, that's right, this Wednesday. Don't forget. We got, Is it uh, this Wednesday? This Wednesday. Is there a nook? No. There's a nook for sale. Yeah, we'll have a free nook giveaway for somebody. Uh, so. T-shirts. 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 Oh, a T-shirt next month for the meeting. This is me. We're going to be giving away one T-shirt for whoever is the lucky winner of the at the business meeting drawing. Okay. Steve will probably be there to bring it in. If not, we'll let it's him. Wed- Wednesday the 8th. Yep. It's a Zoom business meeting, correct? Zoom business meeting, yes. But you Zoom. Meeting? Yes. Who, who won? Hey, who won that thing last time, CG? CG? What? Who won the thing last month when I wasn't there? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, Roger's friend. Uh, yeah, our, our our membership director, second vice president. Vice president. Oh, Samantha oh, won it. Yeah. Sam. Yeah. Samantha did. Okay, Sam won it. Okay. Yep. See, I missed part of last month for some reason, but that's all right. Uh. We're doing good. I don't know if we want to adjourn this meeting or keep on having fun, but I wish we were all going to Applebee's now. Yeah, me too. All righty. Well, uh, hey, Eric. Uh, Eric, you got uh, any queens? Uh, Queen cells. I got I got to go through the hives. I got some things I got to do. I, I may have a queen or two that I can pull out because I got my mating nooks where I have two or three queens in there, and I'm just pulling the dividers out turning it into a one queen hive. So I may have one or two or three, maybe. I don't know for sure. Okay. Well, let's see how you diagnose them, how you feel tomorrow. Yeah. Hey, I I'm got, feeling chipper now. I, I got a shitload of bees I got to deal with up here and, and a date with the state. So. Yeah. You, how many bees you want? <laughs> 
Well, hey, if I, we, if I just give them to you, I don't have to buy the queen. There you go. <laughs> uh, Take it. We'll put them in boxes and send them to California. Yeah, I'm ready. There won't be mediums. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not sending mediums. Okay. But Lee's not sending any? Yeah, but they're not mediums. I actually... Uh, I spent the last weekend uh, actually rebuilding the platform up to my roof bees here, uh, which was not safe. Uh, been on a list a long time and like one more thing I needed to do, but the state is going to come a knocking, so I couldn't let her fall through the platform. Go. Uh, that's half the fun. Ah, uh, trust me. I, I let it go as long as I could. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, but uh, this weekend, you know, we'll see how you're feeling or whatnot. But I might have to get buck ass wild on some stuff here and, and bust them down. And then I got this other guy that I gave uh, bees to down south. I don't know if he ever called you, that guy, Matt. Um, <laughs> Jeff went down to his place to get some wire from him the other day, walked out in his front yard. He got chased out of the freaking yard. Uh, by the bees. Uh, and a lot of that might just be newbie stuff. Because uh, yeah. uh, what that was, was the swarm that I rescued off the dinghy in Riviera Beach Marina and requeened with your queen. But, you know, he didn't listen to me when I told him not to put the queen excluder in when he wanted to slam another honey super on there. And I convinced him to get a bunch of the honey out of the thing. And I said, dude, it's hot. You got bored bees. So I told him, I said, you want to do this now. What you got to do, and you can ask anybody, you're going to have to get in there and split the damn things down. So I don't know if anybody, that's the thing, because I, I, I told him to reach out to you as far as getting queens. So we'll see how you're feeling and what you got available. If okay, well, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a call tomorrow. Yeah, these people got to we'll be figured out. You know, they got to be serious about this stuff. That's right. Can't be a daytime half-ass beekeeper. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the newbie honey search, you know, honey, honey, honey. Honey, honey, that's right. I told him not to put that damn queen uh, excluder when he added a, a super with no drawn comb at all. Uh, but, you know. You made a mess. Well, all right, kids. So, we, hope, uh, we hope to see more of you at the next meeting and uh, stay tuned because we got a couple of work, uh, not workshops, but we got like the Rare Fruit Council coming up in October and Glenn's got an event. So we got a lot of things to talk about. Make sure you come to the business meeting this Wednesday. This all right. Yeah, talk to you later. Thanks all for right. holding down the fort. Thank you all for Thanks, coming. Thanks, Kevin. All righty. Thanks, CG. We're up there. Yep. Bye. Oh, all right, here, let me kill it. Bye, kids. And